Good evening, everyone. My name is George King, and I'm the executive director and curator of the Zillman Art Museum. I'd like to welcome you to this evening's presentation, Creative Conversations, our webinar on Zoom. Of course, I wish we were with you face to face, but we're going to have a really lively evening here with our featured artist, uh, Joanne Carson, whose works are currently on display at ZAM through December 23rd. So uh, just a few things before I introduce Joanne, I, I, then I wanna mention uh, Sarah Belial, our wonderful registrar is running the back of the house here uh, of the operations tonight with this webinar. Please bear with us a bit, a bit if we encounter any technical difficulties. And also I'll mention that you can, we can not see you, you can see us, and you can also put your questions in the uh, webinars Q&A. Others that are on uh, joining us tonight, they won't see your questions, but Sarah will. And we'll be able to get to a few of those a little bit later in the presentation. So now it's a great pleasure to introduce Joanne Carson, um, our featured artist who's, uh, and, and her solo exhibition, uh, Wood Nymphs, that's on display. Joanne splits her time between Brooklyn, New York and Shoreham, Vermont. Her works are represented in many uh, public collections, including the Brooklyn Museum, the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth, the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, the Sheldon Museum of Art, among many others. She's also had quite a lot of museum exhibitions and commercial gallery exhibitions over the years. It was a real pleasure to work so closely with Joanne in curating this exhibition at ZAM. It's really a spectacularly wonderful exhibition as you navigate uh, the galleries. I also wanna mention that in addition to her esteemed career as a visual artist, she's also a distinguished professor of studio art and a graduate director at the, of art and art history at the University of Albany. So um, Joanne, we're so pleased to have you with us uh, this evening and look forward to our conversation. So welcome. Well, thank you so much. And I wanna say that, um, I wanna first of all, thank George Kinghorn for mounting this show, for inviting me to be in the show to begin with and really to go to what I would call heroic efforts to keep the doors open <laughs> in this pandemic era, which you did up until just a week or two ago. Uh, and also to the wonderful staff who installed these very complicated pieces without me being there, made a beautiful video and promoted the show. So it's been just a joy and a pleasure to have the show. And I think at this point, we'll take a walk through with the PowerPoint. So I could ask Sarah to do a screen share and I can walk us through the show in this installation format. So you get a little bit of a sense of what the show is like. So if we can go to the next image, that would be super great. And I wanna say just to begin with, so that you have an understanding of how large the show is or the size of it. The show has three sculptures, two of which are quite large. You can see it in the image on the left side. And the one in the foreground is called blue. There's also about six works on paper. Uh, and we coordinated this selection in order to have a kind of a range of different color, different feeling in the work, but also we really wanted to make it feel like a kind of trip through an enchanted woodland. And I think it has some of those components anyway. So the, the piece in the foreground is called Blue. It's about six feet high. It's made out of aqua resin, acrylic paint, thermoplastic, and it's from 2006. In the image on the right hand side, you can see some of my works on paper. Maybe we'll go to the next image. Here's blue again. I love the way that the museum installed 
the piece so that it has this crazy dancing motion with its own shadows. And I think that you can see from the image on the right how different it appears if you were, it's always hard with sculpture, right? Because you're not walking around it, but it has a kind of dynamic spinning quality if you were to be there in person. Okay, next. This is chlorophyllia. It's very convenient to have the title there. You won't find that title in the dictionary. It's a made up word. Um, and it is about nine feet, well, maybe eight feet tall. And it's made out of thermoplastic, mostly thermoplastic, epoxy resin. Uh, it also is made out of aqua resin. It also is made out of paper pulp. I'll talk a little bit more about how I make this, but this is a kind of orchestration in a monochromatic white. Okay, next image. Here I am standing next to Daphne's victory. This is not in the show, but we thought that it would be good to uh, provide another image of a large work so that you can see the, a little bit about the range of how I use color. I make a lot of very, very large sculpture and then I make some medium sized ones too. As you can see from chlorophyllia, which is monochromatic, that is not always typical of my work, but sometimes it is. But this is a piece from 2018, you know, that obviously is very brightly colored and gilded. Okay, next. This is wood nymph. And it's really tough to see, but you could see it from that other image. It's nine feet tall. It's pretty gargantuan and it comes out about three feet. So this figure in the central part of the log is like a, I think of her as a dancer and a warrior. Uh, she's standing on point. She has a tutu. She's spinning pies. It's a trompe l'oeil image. There's no wood in this. It's really a uh, oil painting in, in a, a polychrome sculpture done with oil paint. And, um, and it's pretty imposing when you're standing right next to it. Okay. And next, oh, and this is called, actually it's called snow day rather than snowy day. Uh, like I always thought about snow day as being the day you get to stay home. Now we do nothing but stay home. So <laughs> it seems less exciting to me. But uh, yeah, it's a, an acrylic painting on paper. Uh, I, George mentioned I'm a painter and a drawer as well as a sculptor. So this was a study for a painting that I did. Okay, we can go to the next images. There they are. These are charcoal drawings. I do drawings that are sometimes studies for work. And sometimes what's brilliant about drawing is the ability to just to create a world. You may find another medium to expand that world or it's just a way to, to allow yourself to think visually. <coughs> and next and final maybe. Yeah, and a couple more drawings. And actually both of these drawings I produced oil paint, uh, not oil paintings but acrylic paintings for and you could see if you want to see more work you can easily see that on my website so I think that's it we're going to return to one of the installation shots and then George is going to grill me with some questions <laughs> as we mentioned before in the in the announcement this is an interview style presentation so it's going to be wonderful to have a bit of a conversation about the works with Joanne and you know, as you look at the whole uh, totality of Joanne's work, one thing that you will notice is her use of color in the composition. So I'd like to kind of start off by talking a little bit about uh, your palette and the colors you've chosen for some of the sculptures. For instance, in the foreground there, I remember when I first visited uh, you when you had a gallery show that kind of got the ball rolling, I saw that wonderful blue sculpture with its very vivid saturated blues and, and things like that. So I was hoping that you could speak a little bit about your relationship with color. Sure. 
And Sarah, could you toggle through that image and get one up just of blue? There we go, beautiful. Uh, yeah, and I would be happy to do that. And in talking about color, it's so united to the way I work on everything, which is deeply improvisational. I think there are different kinds of artists that could be divided broadly into two camps, people who plan and people like myself who plan and then have to improvise because the plan doesn't work. <laughs> so uh, I was making a lot of these, what I'd call medium scale pieces in between 2005 and 2007, this is 06. And each one had a very specific animated characteristic or animated quality. This is extremely corkscrew, and I wanted this piece called Blue um, to have a kind of um, uh, torpedoing quality where it's very busy, but it's not really going anywhere. It's twisted around. Some other pieces that I did at the same during the same period, one was called Argyle, and the color and the pattern was modeled on an Argyle sweater that I had. Uh, and it was had a very different characteristic. It was much more uh, uncertain and kind of sedate, a little like you'd think about Mr. Rogers' Argyle sweater. Another piece was called Sprout that had a kind of shy quality, but also I like to think of it as having like big ambitions. So you can see, and this the coloration of that piece was modeled on my bathroom rug. So it was very pastel. So the colors are sometimes something that I choose to amplify a quality that I find is inherent within the character nature of the piece. And as George mentioned, I'm out of, I, I commute before remote teaching uh, between Brooklyn and Albany. And so when I would be gone for three days and then I come back to my Brooklyn studio and I would open the door and I always had the sensation that these small pieces were like pets that were just so overjoyed to see me. And so they have this kind of quality of subjectivity. And, uh, and, and so the kind of coloration that I used like went in tandem with that feeling. You know, uh, Joanne, kind of a follow-up as, as we were looking and taking a stroll through the exhibition, um, there's a striking contrast between that bold ca uh, palette that you've utilized in blue uh, with, uh, with the chlorophyllia piece that uh, really has pale, white, a very subtle use of color, almost a bit of an absence of color. So could you share a little bit about what your aims were in producing chlorophyllia? Definitely, and maybe we can go to that image of chlorophyllia. That's great. And you and I showed the other large sculpture that's in the Nike collection that's very boldly colored and gilded with metal leaf. Uh, so this piece, and again, you know, keeping in mind that I make decisions and generally push back decisions about color, even if I have a strong idea like I want to make a red piece, I, I may or may not do that because the sculpture perhaps doesn't suggest it. So I hadn't really ever thought so specifically about what the color of this would be. What I did think a lot about was the form of it. And I thought about the way that in a kind of cartoon, like say Wile E. Coyote, the Roadrunner, you know, like just any kind of cartoon elasticized form can be blown up and huge. And then it can be deflated like if Wile E. Coyote goes over the cliff and becomes like thin as a piece of paper, right? So I wanted to make the sculpture like that. I wanted to make big forms, big blown up forms that you can't really see from this angle. And then these little tendrils. Uh, and so in doing that, I used a lot of different materials. I used thermoplastic, which is a plastic that you heat. And when it heats, it slumps and you can push it into a mold or you can pinch it and you can make it into, into flowers. That's these kind of tendrily shapes. Uh, I also use paper pulp around larger uh, sty styrofoam and foam. Um, and I also used epoxy clay. And anyway, it turned out, not with me planning it, that everything was white or gray. 
And when I looked at it, I thought, wow, you know, what you can really see about this sculpture is the process of how it's made. And that greatly appealed to me. And I am much more, I am not about truth to materials. <laughs> I am much more about camouflage and artifice, but I'll say that there's some uh, truthiness to the way that I use process and color together in this piece. And also, if I could just add, this piece was done 12 years after Blue. And so a lot of other ideas transpired and I started painting more in the meantime. That's interesting. You know, Joan, this is more of a, a comment, but, you know, as we were working on the show and, and in your studio uh, in New York and uh, talking about specifics, uh, I think it's interesting to point out the collaboration between curator and artist. We were working specifically and discussing this piece and the circular base there that uh, we utilized that was specifically constructed for the work and, and having that conversation. So I, I, you know, I think one of the things I can tell you because thankfully we have been able to be open to the public for a stretch of time. Um, and as people come in, they're immediately kind of drawn in with the, the amazing cast shadows uh, that, are, that are in the space that almost gives uh, another element uh, to the sculpture with the space. And, and then that kind of, as you move and navigate that circular plinth that we have there is uh, kind, of, kind of underscores the, the circular kind of round nature of the work. Absolutely. I was thrilled when you suggested having a round pedestal and I, I knew it would look great and it absolutely does because it's sculpture is hard, right? You know, you have to put it on the floor and then you have a base that you have to deal with and it becomes part of the sculpture. So if it's not thoughtfully constructed, like if it's in my studio, it was screwed directly into the floor that seemed to work okay. But now, as you pointed out, it has this amplified way of building into the kind of spherical quality that the piece has and the shadows are beautiful. Yeah, I think so too. You know, uh, in your work, Joanne, as you come in, you, you, you get this feeling there's this uh, whimsical approach to nature, uh, specifically as we see in this works here to botanicals. So can you talk a little bit about your origins uh, of the stylization of forms and the kind of quirky renderings that are consistent really in both the two-dimensional work and the sculptures that are in the show and other sculptures that you've created? Sure, I, I'm gonna take you seriously when you use the word origins and I'm gonna go back to uh, my first memory that I can think of that had an aesthetic experience. This is something that I really believe in. I, I haven't met many other people who <laughs> confirm this belief, but I think that we are kind of born with a sensibility and that sometimes you can, um, like I'll ask my students and other artists whom I know, like what's the first thing you remember seeing that you thought of as an aesthetic experience that gave you a sense of joy or wonder or beauty. And nine times out of 10, whatever that answer is, I can see it in their mature work. So that was true for me. So the first thing I remember seeing was Bob's Big Boy, a statue that used to be in front of, I don't think there are Bob's Big Boys anymore, I'm not sure, but it's this creature that is like a boy or a man or a monster. He's holding a tray. He's got a chef's hat on. He's got a checkered apron on him. And it, I still remember feeling like I've never seen anything like this before, this sort of frozen animated moment that of course is very whimsical and would appeal to a child anyway. And the other thing that I was thinking about also in early memory is, and I still think about this, are the dioramas at the Museum of Natural History in New York and the way that the trick of getting a taxidermied animal to fit into these beautifully painted murals. And that's something that I'm very interested in doing in my own work. Like I consider that to be sort of an element of humor when 
I do this in my work where on the one hand, I want it to seem mimetic, like a botanical, but on the other hand, I show you that it's a trick. So it's a magic trick that's being performed, but it's always revealing how it's made. I was also thinking like when I was in graduate school, I had to write a paper and I wrote my paper on Freud, uh, his book, Wit and its Relation to the Unconscious. My mentor said that it was not a funny paper and it definitely was not, it had nothing to, it wasn't funny, but it was about humor. And the main thing that I remember after all these years was that Freud said that one element or method of humor was the mechanical masquerading as the organic. And I think that really encapsulates what I'm doing in my work. I never try to hide the joints of where pieces go together. They're built like a kit. They're numbered in big numbers, um, but they also kind of bring you in to thinking that something is beautiful like a flower and then you can see, oh, no, no, it's just, it's like a puppet of a flower. <laughs> and Joanne, um, we have a question from our audience here. And um, since we have this slide up, it's appropriate. It's thinking about shadows. They're wondering if it's a significant factor during your sculptural process, uh, like we're seeing these cast shadows in chlorophyllia. You know, I've kind of given myself over to not always having control of where my work is exhibited and what the conditions are. Like this is ideal, what you guys have done in making those shadows. They're beautiful. The room can be darkened. You have a round plinth. But a lot of times, in fact, I showed this piece at a 27 year um, survey recently, and we didn't have any ability to control the light, but we painted the wall behind it dark blue so that it became almost more like a silhouette and sort of flattened out. So there's always different options and it has a bit of a uh, theatrical relationship to pieces around it too. So I wish I had more control over the shadows than I generally do. But um, my very early work which had a trompe l'oeil aspect, I painted shadows into the work. That was the best way I could control it. <laughs> I think it's true, you know, as we work on shows, you know, very much it's about responding to space and uh, every museum space, gallery space, somewhat different. It creates a different set of challenges as we organize these exhibitions. You know, since we already spoke about it, um, this work, uh, this is another question from the audience that, are curious about how do you feel about the Dr. Seuss type comparison uh, as it relates to blue, that kind of gesture yeah. that you see in, in blue. Right, right. Um, you know, it used to make me feel that there was something underdeveloped about the sensibility, like it's for children. But I also know that something that's for children has a deep appeal. Kids love my work, they're crazy about it. And, uh, and recently when I posted on Instagram advertising this talk, two very, very, very sophisticated artists, well-known artists wrote to me and go, I love blue. That kind of, you know, all artists need some encouragement, right? So you don't want to think about well, first of all, Dr. Seuss is genius, right? So it's not so bad to be compared to that. And I do feel like my work is about play, childlike wonder at the world, uh, a kind of surrogate figure. It's a sculpture, but it's a stand in for how we feel when you're out of sorts and you're flying apart, your hands are out and your brains are scrambled. Do you know what I mean? It's not joyful. I think it, there's something more worried or preoccupied about it when you really spend any time with it, with the sculpture. Wow. So I guess I feel of, of different ways about it. I, I, I like the association, but I think it operates on, on, on a number of different levels. Interesting. You know, um, many of your sculptures, you know, we're, we're, if you, I would encourage you all that are out there to visit uh, Joanne's website and actually take a look at some of her other sculptural works because they're really quite wonderful. But I, I just want to mention that 
many of the sculptures, including the two in this exhibitions that we saw, and also in that early slide, uh, it's not in the exhibition, but it's represented in the Nike collection, Daphne's Victory. They're quite large uh, works. So I was hoping you could talk a bit about the scale and how the size of the works might relate to the viewer. And when we see that uh, image from the Nike collection, Daphne's Victory there with you standing next to it. So, you know, as viewers come into a, a gallery or a museum space and see the works, I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Absolutely. And this piece was a commission from Nike. Uh, they bought an earlier piece called Puppet's Revenge. And so when I was making Daphne's Victory, I thought of it as being a companion piece to that 10 year old piece that I was making. Uh, so I wanted to make it the same size. So there were some dictates that were in place already. But I also wanted to make this very female and very aggressive in its sort of femaleness. And I wanted to turn the story of Daphne who was turned into a tree into something that had a more subjective meaning she's less of an object and more of a subject. So I think that the scale kind of operates in two, well, maybe more than two ways. I mean, one is it's, it's kind of delightful to come into a room with things that are generally so tiny and you could feel like a bumblebee or some little insect bobbing around it, you know, to enjoy the upending of what a conventional scale is. So I like that very much. But the other thing is what I just touched on is that I want these sculptures to have a imposing quality, literally like imposing on your space. They're beautiful maybe or but they're aggressive too. And she has feet, you know, so it's like spider feet as if she could scuttle across the floor. I once what made the mistake of telling a small child that this could move. And he just like was mesmerized and just glued to watching. But of course, you know, I don't have children so I'm not necessarily appropriate in, in what I tell to kids. Uh, and so that's the main thing. I mean, I, I think spectacle, uh, a kind of imposing on the viewer space and a sense of surprise and delight. Well, no, Joanne, kind of a follow-up to there. Are there any particular challenges in working large scale? And also, you know, are there any just uh, uh, size works that you're just not interested in pursuing? Is there anything that you're like works of a certain size? I, I really don't, I, I, I'm not interested in making that or something. I would say that the only scale that I'm really not interested in is tiny because I don't have the tools to work on a very small scale, but I also make dioramas that are kind of assist or aids for making paintings. And I make that more what I call small scale, but really it's not, I mean, blue is like six feet tall. So it's not, you know, it's not tiny, but I think that with the scale like blue and the other two pieces I described to you, they're more like companions or friends or pets. You know, they have characteristics, they have personality. I don't feel that way about the bigger pieces. The bigger pieces, I want to have a different kind of impactfulness of a creature that has both beauty and danger associated to it. And to answer your question, there's nothing but problems working on a large scale, <laughs> but they can be solved. You know, I'm not trained as a sculptor. I don't know how to weld, for example. And so for the uh, armature, I pay a welder. I don't want to learn to weld. I live in a, you know what I mean? I don't want to give myself over to learning other newer processes that are more conventionally for a sculptor. So that's where it starts. And then after that, I've taught myself or invented a way of making this interlocking system so that I'll work on a big flower and then it fits into a slot. So there's a male and female part. Each one is made unique to each uh, armature or, or appendage rather. It fits together, then I label it, you know, this is number one, this is number two, et cetera, like that. So I shipped this piece to um, Portland, Oregon for the Nike collection. 
it comes apart into 60, 60 pieces. Some of the pieces are five feet long. Uh, because it's made out of thermoplastic, it cannot get hot. So for example, I wanted to borrow a piece back that the Brooklyn Museum owns. And they said, yeah, you can borrow it back, but it's gonna take two art handlers, an air conditioned truck, everything's gonna be created. It's gonna cost $11,000 to move it. Yeah, you know, which is so crazy because I didn't know how much professional shipping would cost. I brought that piece to the Brooklyn Museum in several car loads, soft wrapped in garbage bags. <laughs> so, so shipping is definitely, shipping and storage, of course, are going to be um, solvable problems, but nonetheless, they're, you know, you have to plan around them. Well, you know, Joanne, like, as an artist that's exhibited widely and in museums and and um, you know commercial galleries and things like that, are there any kind of expectations from the art world to work on a certain scale, or uh, are the, is that ever a consideration or something that's on your mind? Well, I am not an expert on what the expectations of the art world are. <laughs> you know because you know, you're either lucky and you're making the kind of work that the art world wants to show. You know, I can't, and no artist that I know, you, you can make some considerations in your work based around opportunities. And I definitely would do that. Like if I was given the floor of a museum or a big room, oh my God, I would be hugely encouraged to provide other sorts of ideas. I would love that. But otherwise you're working sort of for a fickle customer because times change and I've lived and been an artist long enough to see things radically shift and will and I know they will shift again. But I do think also that I intend to um, make more proposals for bigger spaces uh, that have, as I described the dioramas, I would so love to make you know, big mural sized paintings and have sculptures fit into them. I have this idea that I could make through the magic of theatrical lighting and theater paint. I don't know anything about this. I'd have to find this out, it's just my fantasy, that I could have a shifting diorama that would go from dawn to night. That's something I could only do with the support of an institution. I don't know if that will ever happen. So to answer your question, I think it flows both ways, which is that you can make proposals and I think you can get, and it allows you to think in a bigger way. If I was only thinking about the, the confines of my studio, I probably wouldn't do anything very differently than I am. But now, for example, that I live in Vermont and we have 12 acres, I've got an enormous topiary garden that is like an outdoor sculpture. I think of it that way. So um, yeah, so that's my answer. I think that there's, you can be encouraged or discouraged. <laughs> I think it's better to be encouraged. Right. Well, you know, kind of shifting a bit, uh, early on we looked at uh, Wood Nymph, the sculpture, and Sarah, maybe if you could flip to that piece. Um, in the work, we really can't see any references to facial details or things like that, but the form appears uh, feminine. It's a feminine form. There, you know, this kind of implied domesticity um, in the activity of making pies or, you know, as I say, like keeping all of these balls in the air or these pies in the air. Um, so I'm wondering if you, if there's an underlying feminist uh, message uh, in the work uh, and, and your thoughts on that. Absolutely, and I'm really glad you asked that question. I had a student, uh, a woman, maybe now eight years ago, and during a critique, I asked her if her work was feminist. And she was so startled, she just stopped and she said, I don't think I know enough about feminism to answer that question. And I thought, my God, that's so crazy because feminism could be seen as an academic discipline. And if you haven't done the reading, you can't lay claim. So I would say that you have to sort of define for oneself what feminism is or how you use it. 
Uh, I think I'm sort of in the Judy Chicago camp where I take things that are commonly attributed as tropes or cliches to women and I crank them up and take away instead of objectifying that, I make that quality more like a subject. And, and I mentioned earlier, I think of this character who's definitely female. She's a ballerina, she's got a tutu, she's multi-armed, maybe multitasking. Um, she's got pies. So she's a kind of riff on a Hindu goddess Durga, the many armed goddess of the universe who has <laughs> not pies, but weapons. So there's a whimsical quality. She's in Western European art, as you know, you know, women are so associated with nature, men are associated with culture, women in common, you know, popular culture associated more as domestic caretakers. So those are the two things that I play on. I, I can't say that I started, this sculpture took a lot, like years to make. First I made the figure and then I wrapped her, I didn't know what to do with it. I wrapped her in a synthetic braid. I, then finally I abandoned it, I put her in the corner. And then maybe two years later, I sort of discovered her like a found object. And I had this kind of very clear vision that she needed to do something and she needed to sort of be born from this big block, this big log. And, and you know, frankly, once I have an idea, I never think about how impractical it is. I just have that vision, like I'll figure it out. You know, um, for those of you, uh, you know, as we were working on the show and Sarah, our registrar and Aaron, our uh, preparator knows, I mean, there's a bit of magic in the way that you constructed this work. So it really leads into my next question. You know, the piece actually comes in a number of pieces in it it goes up quite beautifully and it's all kind of, um, it's construction is somewhat uh, in certain ways mass the way that you created it. But it, it is, uh, once it's on the wall, it looks like one incredibly large, large unit. So, you know, it kind of kind of leads into this question is that, you know, you see this in the exhibition and this work in particularly that, and your other works as well, is that you freely explore a wide range of materials and processes and uh, you know all of the different materials that you mentioned in your comments so far. So could you share a, a bit about your journey with materials, a little bit about your creative process? Oh, I'd absolutely love to because that's been such a main path of my journey. I, I'll say that I inherited um, that optimism of learning new things from my family. My mother was an artist and my father was an engineer. And it was always like, well, let's make a patio or let's build a cinder block wall to hold back this gigantic hill. Let's, let's see if we can make our own shoes. <laughs> it was like that. And, you know, my mother came from immigrant family and I think it was just sort of in her upbringing. And, I, I, and we never got discouraged and things wouldn't work and then we find another way of doing it. I feel just dumbstruck that when I'm teaching and I have my students like paint something with a paint roller, they've never used a paint roller. So I'll say, well, like how many people have painted their bedrooms? Like nobody. So I don't know like how common that is. Perhaps it's not common anymore. So I'm very, very open. I love learning new things and um, and yet it was very difficult when I started because there was no internet, there was no Dr. Google, there was no, no one to ask except sculptors and no offense to sculptors since I am one, sculptors ordinarily know how to make something in one way. But I didn't wanna weld and I didn't wanna pour bronze and I didn't wanna do anything that had a lot of material process to it or special equipment. So a friend of mine who, Donna Langman, who is in the world of theater, she introduced me to some prop builders in, um, in New York City. This was in maybe 98 or 99. And I went to their shop and it was revelatory because it, there still was no internet, but there was a book called the New York 
theatrical guide to materials or something like that. Then I realized I could learn a lot by shopping. So you become familiar with materials. And that's when I learned about thermoplastic and aqua resin. And what I found was that when I, over the years, I mean, first you learn one thing and then everything is made that way. Then you learn another thing, mold making. And so at over, I don't know how many years, maybe five years, I learned how to make, it was like learning a language. I learned enough vocabulary that I became fluent in my ability to make things. So, uh, and of course, what I like is a kind of theatrical point of view. And so that's the world I sort of inhabit more than, well, there is no traditional sculpture really anymore. Right, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm just as traditional as any other sculptor. That's right, yeah. It's certainly, that is true. I mean, artists now, the they, uh, sculptors in particular, they're working in a wide range of materials and processes and incorporating video into the sculptural work. So it really is a, there is no one dedication to just bronze or just stone necessarily that is kind of uh, out there. So this ties in beautifully, a question from our audience how do you achieve your shapes, particularly in thin leaves, in the thin leaves and the twisting tendrils? Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're talking a bit about chlorophyllia there. Yeah, maybe we can go back to that one, Sarah, chlorophyllia, or this one. And yeah, that's good. Um, okay. The way, okay, so thermoplastic is as thin as mat board. That's about the weight of it. It's a piece of plastic that's a sandwich. It has cheesecloth on both sides of it. So what you do is you cut out a shape, say it's a petal, you heat it with a hot air gun, it slumps. You gotta be careful not to overheat it. It slumps after about 20 seconds. And during that 20 seconds, it's limp and it's warm. So you can, I make molds of a petal. So that's one way to do it. And I take that and I push it into a mold and then I wait for it to cool. That could take five minutes. And then like a cookie coming out of a muffin tin, you pop it out and that's the shape and it holds that shape. So that's one way that you can make the petals. So I have, it's hard to, I can't point to anything, but in, Okay, so the piece that's at the very bottom, that's blue and white toward the bottom of the sculpture, which I think is like a chrysanthemum possibly, you know, it's not really any one thing. That has like 32 pieces to it. And I had a wheel that had the flat pieces and then curved at the very end. So each wheel I would heat up and I'd put it in that mold so it's kind of slight just so that the edges of the petals would turn. And, and by the way, you know how I learned this? I didn't learn this from looking at nature because mother nature is way too imposing. I looked at artificial flowers. I saw the way an artificial flower was made. And so I got some of the standards of how to do that from looking at that. And then I was able to design and engineer my own. Interesting. So uh, Joanne, you know, being an academic um, museum here, I think this might be an interesting question. You know, you of course have a very rigorous studio practice and, and are, have your work out in museums and galleries, as we mentioned, but you're also a distinguished university professor. So I'm wondering um, how your teaching has inspired your studio practice or, or vice versa. Yes. And by the way, I was just named a distinguished professor last week. And um, I, I don't feel that different. I don't feel distinguished. <laughs> I wish there was a title like hilariously funny professor or something, but um, you know, but I've been around long enough to get that promotion and I'm honored by it. Uh, it's a tough question in an interesting way because I have taught my entire adult life. And so the thread of teaching and being an artist are very woven together. Uh, but as I think about it in a really honest way, 
because of course I could say, you know, it gets in the way and it takes so much time and I'd rather be in the studio. Some of those things are true, but it is as equally true that it's uh, challenging in a way because what I'm sharing with my students, both undergraduate and graduate, but particularly graduate, my only credentials are being an artist. That's what I'm sharing with them. So I've had probably over 400 graduate students in my whole career. And what that experience is like is you visit them one-on-one -on -one in their studio, they open the door, they might make you a cup of tea, you look at their work, it's very quiet, I feel like I'm their teacher, I'm a critic, I'm a coach, I'm a therapist, I'm a friend, I'm a role model, you know, and I'm, what I'm trying to do is to assess what, what they want. Because sometimes you don't know what you want or you don't know what you're best at. Uh, I also share with them, and this is where I think it probably has, teaching has affected my own ideas about being an artist because I have to objectify. I think about like how I'm responding to failure, you know, and thinking, oh, I should share this with my students. I objectify it a little bit because I'm an expert on failure. You know, every artist is an expert on failure and understanding that when you fail, it's very frustrating, but it opens up other possibilities that you have to solve. So those are some of the things that I feel that I give to my students and that the relationship is two way. And sometimes I'll be talking to, you know, students don't always like you. You're not always helping them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's a team effort and I have great colleagues and I've had great colleagues over the years. So we go at it sort of as a, as a team, but sometimes what will happen is that I'll say something to a student and I think they're not going to use that. You know, that's an idea I could use for myself. So I think that it has a broad field. Just last week, Wayne Tebow, the great painter in Northern California, turned 100 years old. And I heard him interviewed. He's unbelievably modest. He said, you know, I just think of myself as an old art teacher. He taught in, at UC Davis until, in, until he was in his early 70s. And I thought, well, that's a pretty great validation for the occupation. It made me feel proud. That's right. Well, um, we have just two more questions. I'm being mindful of time tonight. Mm -hmm. Two more questions, and they are from our uh, audience there. And one of them is how, and this is a perfect work to be up with this question. How does your home garden influence your work? Is it different or not from Monet? Oh my God. I think Monet had 30 full-time gardeners, didn't he? <laughs> I don't have anybody to help. I mean, if I did, I would totally go crazy. But uh, it absolutely had a huge impact when I, I was not thrilled about moving to the country, but uh, I was wrong because it changed everything about how I looked at nature. The thing that mostly influenced me, so as I mentioned, we have 12 acres, but the only piece that I was interested in was the rectangle of, of that I could see out of my kitchen window because it was, it was like making a painting. And that's what I did. I would like put something there and I'd come back in the kitchen and I'd look to see how it looked framed. And people would come over, Vermont, you know, contractors or whomever and they'd like be so puzzled like why are you only gardening in that one area but I did it in uh and it's on a very steep slope so when I'm saying gardening what I really mean is lifting rocks I found out later that the contractors called me Aunt Joanne not A-U-N-T but A-N-T because I was just relentless about lifting pulling you know these huge rocks up the hill and it, it, it's, I don't even know how to describe it. I was ecstatic the first two summers. That's the only word I can use. I've, I've read and I believe this, that there's some kind of bacteria or something in soil that operates like serotonin. It makes you, and I, I know that I was just, the plants were making me work that hard. <laughs> I didn't really want to. So then when I come back into my studio, which overlooks the garden, it gives me ideas about, I draw from the garden and I 
shape the plants in a topiary way so that they're more like my paintings. So it, yeah, absolutely. There's a huge um, du duet, I guess, between the two. Great. Um, here's another great question from our audience. We can, uh, we see familiar uh, and similar forms in your drawings and your sculpture. So do you tend to use drawing as a starting point for your sculpture? Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. When I first, it was very, very, very hard for me to figure out how to make sculpture, not because of the technical problems, but because conceptually, I, I couldn't imagine how to do it. I didn't, drawing, I wanted to make something so complicated, I didn't know how to make a drawing. But what I did, and this I do not recommend because this is not how you make sculpture, I, I had a photograph of myself and I would stand in one place in my studio and I would look at my cheek and I would look at what I where I was working and I think I'm going to make a flower that looks like a cheek then I would make that flower it would take whatever a week I'd put it in the place then then I'd make a forehead and then I'd make an ear and then I'd make an eye then you take a step to the left or the right you start all over again that's why I said that's not how you make sculpture but that's how I could translate working from two dimensions to three dimensions. And then once I did that, I, I developed, again, I developed a form language that I was able to um, make more predictable as a format. So, but yet I still don't really make, I make a lot of drawings and I make whimsical drawings of big bouquets, but I don't, I like to have the freedom of what the material will do as a surprise. So I may do a drawing that has, like I would want, and I haven't ever made this sculpture, but I'd like to, I do drawings that looks like a tree is doubled by the wind pulling it. So that gives me an idea. And then maybe in the future, I'll make something about that. Yeah, sculpture is very slow, it takes a long time to make, takes a long time to think about. So drawing is a very primary part of my practice, but it's not always one-to-one. -one. Like I do a drawing and then I do a sculpture. Got it, got it. Well, I wanna, uh, one, thank Joanne for uh, her, one, her sharing her works with our visitors at the museum. And uh, it's been a wonderful uh, time. I recognize it's been a challenge for everyone during this pandemic but it's been nice that we've been able to have people come in and see the exhibition. It's a wonderful experience going through, but I think also just seeing some of the installations images we shared tonight, you really do get a sense of what is a really wonderful, almost magical exhibition at the museum. So I, I want to uh, tell all of our uh, audience, uh, people tuning in with us, uh, to please stay safe and healthy. We look forward at the Zillman Art Museum to a point, hopefully sooner than later, to be able to share our space with you again and see you face to face and ultimately have Joanne or any of our featured artists uh, on site to, uh, to speak directly to our visitors. But this has been a, a wonderful uh, evening I am uh, in my uh, kitchen here, and we Sarah kind of matched the colors of the slides to my green wall of my kitchen. So I'm hoping that during this holiday season, you're doing some wonderful things in the kitchen and enjoying yourself and minimizing any stress you might have uh, caused by the pandemic. But ultimately, I, I want to. Thank you for your support of the Zillman Art Museum. Um, as you know, we're Maine's Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art. And we are about to embark on a very ambitious construction project with five new galleries. So looking forward to bringing more dynamic contemporary artists such as Joanne uh, Carson's work to our visitors uh, in Maine and visitors to the state of Maine. So. We'll say goodbye to now, uh, for now, and a uh, thank, thanks to Joanne, and also a thanks to Sarah Belial, our registrar, and Serge for being there with us and 
and taking us through this webinar. So have a great evening and have a great holiday. Thank See you. you. Thanks so Bye. much. Thank you.